OK, um, can you please confirm that uh, the screen is visible? I have, sh I have shared one window. But yes, uh, the, the title is the title is energy efficiency in computing system that is visible. OK, fine. So it's not can try to navigate. Can you try to navigate one or two slides so that we can see the movement also? Huh, now it is visible. Yes, yes. Good. Thank you. Also, I have shared only one window and uh, that is what is visible, right? Not the whole screen because I wanted to keep. Yeah, yeah or only only one screen. Yes. OK, good. So because I wanted to keep uh, part of the screen visible for any comments uh, on the teams. Uh, OK. So, OK. OK, uh, thank you and let's start. It's uh, uh, also it will be good how you would like to handle the question. So please let um, me. OK, so yeah, um, uh, uh, since uh, anyway, we are a small group. Um, I would say uh, uh, if anybody has a question at any time during the presentation, please interrupt uh, right away. Uh, I have possibly more content today than I can finish um, within the uh, scheduled time, but uh, there is a second slot uh, next week when we would be continuing on some of uh, uh, this uh, same topics and evolving. So the, today's topic is power and energy efficiency uh, in various computing systems. These modules ought to be already familiar with us uh, from the previous um, um, lectures as part of the winter school. Um, uh, so we'll uh, even if we don't finish everything that is uh, fine because uh, we'll just continue that into uh, the uh, interaction next week where we'll also be talking about uh, uh, the temperature effects um, this power and energy uh, dissipation causes uh, temperature issues that uh, uh, need to be handled in some explicit ways so anyway these are connected so that's how we will be um, designing the interaction. So by uh, by all means, uh, please go ahead and uh, ask your questions. Uh, I'll try to monitor the chat window, but uh, do they have uh, permission to also speak if they have a question? Yes, yes, they can, they can unmute and speak, yes. OK, fine. OK, you can unmute yourself and, and speak if you have their permission. So uh, we can do it in that mode. So shall we start? Uh, yes, sir. OK, um, welcome everyone. OK, so today's uh, discussion is about uh, energy efficiency and power efficiency. Uh, we'll just uh, introduce these terms, uh, um, why they are important, what causes power dissipation, all of these things uh, um, in subsequent uh, uh, slides. Um, but the domain here is uh, computing systems, which means that uh, we will uh, restrict ourselves to the modules that we are already familiar with. Uh, OK, so these are uh, our regular processor pipeline, our register file, uh, cache memory, um, and all these uh, other terms uh, that uh, we already know, the, the functionality uh, we sort of understand. So I will not go into the functionality. I'll assume that, uh, of course, these have been covered when the processor pipeline was covered and when the memory hierarchy was covered. But we will assume that uh, uh, background and uh, we'll um, go ahead with uh, some um, discussion on um, what it means uh, from a power efficiency point of view and say an energy efficiency point of view. Uh, uh, where are those opportunities in those uh, specific components? We'll also be talking about larger components like server uh, systems. Um, there too, where are the opportunities? But still the building blocks are the ones that are already familiar uh, and uh, we'll just assume that that functionality is already known. So that will help us go into example uh, ways to reduce power and uh, in general to uh, to exercise this uh, trade off that exists between power and energy and performance. Uh, that is the subject of this lecture. So let's uh, first introduce the metrics. What do we mean? And what are we measuring when we say energy and power efficiency? Uh, first thing to point out is that there is no single metric and depending on whatever 
the metric is that is the most suitable for us, uh, the decision might be very different. So uh, example metrics are these. One is uh, um, uh, when you say a power efficient system, you just say um, you try to uh, I mean, you measure power efficiency in terms of average power or peak power. Even here, actually, it is not clear uh, which one to use. The context uh, somehow uh, tells us what is uh, the one that is uh, is the more convenient one, which is the one that is appropriate. Um, peak power just means the maximum uh, power. So in this example here, where you have uh, time on the X axis and power on the Y axis, now the power is constant over time, but it might not be uh, constant. Of course, a complex uh, system like a uh, uh, processor or a computer, uh, of course, um, the power dissipated depends on what is happening in that system uh, at that point in time. So it would usually not be a simple uh, constant curve. It would be all over the place. And peak uh, just means what is the maximum uh, that uh, we are allowed to draw. Uh, there may be some infrastructural limitations that uh, force us to operate within the peak power and we ought to be aware of that. There is also average power. Um, that is just the total energy divided by time that gives us uh, a different metric. Energy is just the total energy um, dissipated by the system. Um, in these computing systems, sometimes it helps to use a sort of a very high level abstraction that uh, tells us uh, if you access a register file, um, then that much energy uh, is uh, dissipated. If you access a memory or if you perform a read operation on a memory um, of a certain configuration, then that much energy is uh, uh, dissipated. If it is a ride, then so much. If it is a network and uh, uh, there's a router of a network that needs to be accessed, then so much energy. So it might help to usually to characterize uh, our subsystems in terms of a very simplistic model. Of course, it need not be as simple as that. Um, there would be a lot of other parameters. Uh, but uh, to start with, uh, since we are talking about uh, relatively high levels of abstractions, um, we can um, characterize these systems uh, for energy in those terms. And uh, when we say energy, that's the total energy that we want to um, minimize, uh, optimize. It could also be, uh, so these are not the only ones, and there are others uh, like energy delay product that might be interesting. Uh, let's just uh, motivate that uh, uh, a little bit. So here is a comparison. I have two graphs here. Maybe it's the same system or maybe different systems I'm trying to compare. One has uh, lower average power. So A has lower average power. B has higher power. However, uh, A takes longer and uh, B finishes, uh, finishes uh, uh, in a shorter period of time. Now, how do you compare these two systems? In terms of power, um, average power, peak power, all of these metrics, um, you actually have A is the better uh, system. That's the one that is preferred because uh, the power is less. However, if you look at energy, which is the product of uh, power, it is the area under that curve, right? The area of that rectangle. Then uh, this is an example of a system. A is actually lower power, but higher uh, energy. Right. So there is that trade off that is involved that we ought to be a little cautious about. Lower power is not necessarily lower energy because um, usually the way the computing systems work, the technology works is that um, if you. Um, so how do you reduce power? So sometimes so when, there are some standard knobs uh, that help us, uh, but uh, one example is you just reduce the voltage, then the power uh, um, consequently reduces. Uh, that is a sort of a simple way to reduce power. But one of the things that uh, happens is if I reduce the voltage, then the delay increases. Uh, right, the same transistors become slower if you reduce the voltage, and uh, therefore this effect. Uh, this is not just a theoretical thing. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, may happen actually in practice, which is that you reduce. So maybe this was the original system. B was the original system. Uh, at the highest voltage, uh, the power was higher, but it was also a faster system and uh, it finished faster. The other one, you reduce the voltage, the power got reduced, but then uh, the execution time got stretched out. The, the, how much it got stretched out? Maybe there is an exaggeration here, but it's just worth uh, 
remembering that uh, this is a different uh, axis of optimization. And if I want to optimize total energy, uh, then it is that that product and that area that I'm talking about. And so it's not necessarily energy efficient. Uh, what is better with respect to power is not always uh, better with respect to um, just total energy. Um, okay, so that is one concern. So both of them, uh, uh, both power and energy uh, could be actually suitable. So uh, we have uh, called uh, um, today's discussion, we've, we're largely going to concentrate on energy efficiency. Sometimes we interchangeably use that with power efficiency. It can be interchanged if your time is actually equal, then it is okay. Um, because uh, then the denominator is the same uh, and then the uh, energy efficiency tracks power efficiency, but often it might not be and it uh, is something that we should uh, keep in mind. The other thing that happens is, um, consider these two systems, I have A and B, um, in which uh, on the right and um, these two have actually the same energy, right? A started uh, uh, at some point, uh, finished after uh, some delay. That was the same, that was matching that of B. So what is the difference between these two systems? I just uh, postponed the starting of A, maybe because the system was busy, it was uh, doing something else. Now, maybe what I'm interested in is the finish time ultimately of uh, that task. And uh, therefore, uh, postponing the execution must uh, um, influence the metric in some way. It's not influencing energy uh, because uh, the energy of A and B are equal. Power is also equal. But the fact that uh, the delay has increased just because the starting increased, that also should uh, cover in some way. Um, and this is a, a simple way to also introduce uh, um, uh, delay maybe give some higher priority to delay in a metric called energy delay product uh, where uh, you multiply the energy uh, with the delay which of course energy itself uh, is power times the the delay even though actually in this case there is not much energy that is uh, dissipated by the system in, in this time but uh, nevertheless uh, if you want to give higher priority uh, or lower priority then to that energy uh, metric can be adjusted in some simple way. You just, just it, it just becomes like uh, energy delay or energy delay square or something. Depending on which one you want to give higher priority to, you can correspondingly use a higher exponent uh, to the base energy delay product. You could also have energy square times delay if that is the one that is uh, a higher priority. So yeah, um, just wanted to introduce even before we go anywhere into the computing system, it's uh, worth knowing what is it uh, that we are comparing against when we say power efficiency and energy efficiency. Ultimately, this has to be quantified in terms of a metric that is relevant to us. Uh, and uh, what this is showing is uh, that which metric is relevant is not very obvious. Actually, it depends on the uh, context uh, quite a bit uh, and uh, this is where if you have a server system or a desktop or a laptop or a mobile uh, and a phone and so on, the uh, metric that you want to optimize might be slightly different from each other. Like if a system is operating on a battery, then the energy might be actually the most uh, important one uh, because um, um, you want the battery to last as much as uh, possible. But uh, if it is connected to mains power, then perhaps you want to, um, um, then maybe it is the performance that is the most important. Uh, so um, the, the use cases are different and uh, some in some way, the way we respond uh, to our constraints and our requirements would of course very much depend on that uh, use case. There is a case for maximum performance. We would take different set of decisions. There is a case for minimum energy. We would operate differently. There may be also a case for uh, just uh, um, minimizing the peak power uh, just because uh, there is there may be some infrastructural uh, limitations. Our system, our uh, power supply might be limited uh, in terms of how much power we can draw. Um, so in such a case, the peak power is actually uh, important and that's something that we want to uh, minimize. So the, that's just the overall canvas under which uh, anything that we do uh, in these uh, computing systems uh, with respect to power and energy, um, they uh, are uh, 
Uh, so it has to be placed somewhere along uh, this grid, and uh, that's an important thing uh, to keep in mind even before we start. But let's go, go on with what is it that we can do, assuming that it is energy efficiency, uh, which usually means that it is total energy that we want to uh, minimize. Um, uh, so let's start off with what are our uh, optimization mechanisms? So the basic strategies are actually quite common. In fact, uh, the, uh, it isn't even limited to uh, to computing systems, uh, even if it is uh, much, uh, even if it's a very application specific system, there is a particular um, controller um, for a washing machine or something like that that I'm trying to design. Then to, so anytime there is logic, uh, then, uh, there, then there are a set of optimizations that are common here. I'll take this question. Why does the delay increase with decrease in voltage? That's uh, just uh, the way the transistors work. The CMOS transistors that we are using um, in the modern technology uh, has this uh, characteristic uh, that if the voltage is lower, uh, then it takes longer to charge and discharge uh, uh, I mean, if it is uh, lower or higher, uh, then it takes longer to charge or discharge some given, uh, uh, no, some uh, given load. Uh, that is how one should see it. From a technology point of view, we can take that as uh, given. Um, um, right. So, what is that dependence? It is a more complex dependence, but as far as we are concerned, it could be that we just say um, it is proportional the delay is inversely proportional or something we can we could treat it uh, like that so the higher the uh, voltage the lower the uh, delay um, but uh, uh, but we'll uh, keep it at that this so we take it as an input from the technology okay so this power optimization mechanisms in general um, as uh, whenever you have any kind of digital logic uh, there is uh, a given set of uh, um, strategies that, that are actually common. What can you do? You reduce the activity, right? So in this uh, CMOS uh, technology, uh, the more the activity, um, the, uh, the more the energy, that of course is obvious. Uh, this is uh, just uh, a physics principle. So if you um, want to reduce power, or want to reduce energy, then what do you do? You just reduce the activity. Um, activity for us means what? Um, in the processor and the computing systems context, um, instruction execution is an activity. Memory access is an activity. Uh, register file access is an activity. Um, the uh, addition, um, an adder doing addition, that is activity. Multiplier doing multiplication, that's an activity. So all of these things are activities. Um, so what do you mean by reducing activity? Um, so, uh, let, we'll uh, take uh, an example. Uh, we'll take a look at several examples. Um, where is the choice? Uh, do you really have a choice? The instruction needs to be executed means it has to be executed. So where is the question of reducing activity? Uh, so there may be some interesting questions here. We'll look at it. Well, other let's look at other things. Exploit idle times. Um, there may be times that you are idle because you are waiting for uh, somebody to return um, some data or something like that. A, a, CPU, a CPU pipeline is stalled waiting for memory to return a data. This is an, a, a typical example of idle time. Um, what can we do about it? Um, because we are not doing much, because we are idle, uh, there would usually be some setting where I can take the system to a sleep mode or a low power mode. Um, that would just mean that maybe I shut down part of the system. So uh, coming back to the way these systems um, determine energy, uh, the one is activity. That's the first thing that determines energy. More activity means more energy. Other thing is, even if I'm not doing any activity at all, then to the system, just because you have turned it on, and for example, a memory is a good example of such a system, it has to store data, right? Even if you are not accessing the data, it, it still needs to be stored in the memory. And the storage of, uh, just retaining the storage also requires uh, energy, right? Uh, so there is, uh, you can think of two kinds of energy that's uh, uh, relevant here. One is the dynamic energy that is related to just the activity here. Um, and that is proportional to the activity in some way. 
The other is a static energy, often called a leakage uh, energy. That static energy is dissipated even if uh, um, you are not doing anything. Right? For example, in the memory, you are not accessing the memory, but still the memory has to retain its uh, content. And that also um, re uh, you know, requires uh, energy. Uh, and uh, so that's another kind of uh, energy. These, the total energy may be just the sum of these two, the static and the dynamic uh, component. So when you have idle, it means that you're, uh, when you are idle, then the activity is zero. So the dynamic component is, is zero, but uh, there would still be some static component which we could reduce through some sleep mode, uh, low power mode and, and so on. Often processors and uh, memories have these, uh, these modes. Uh, how they work, we'll get to. But uh, um, the other thing that is also related here is a voltage and a frequency scaling. Uh, you see why frequency scaling? Uh, frequency scaling means I change the frequency at which the processor is running. Of course, uh, um, higher frequency means uh, um, lower, uh, so higher clock rate, so lower clock period. I'm doing more activity per unit time. Right? So more instructions are executed per unit time. That will increase the energy. Um, so um the, the point is that this is a knob that is available for us uh, how do i uh, so if for higher frequency i also need to increase the voltage so these two are connected i can call it the voltage uh, scaling or frequency scaling but in general uh, modern processors uh, allow us to choose between one of several settings um, which are combinations of voltage and and frequency and we need to choose the one of them and higher voltage means higher frequency and higher power uh, lower voltage means lower frequency and lower power of course uh, that is uh, intuitively obvious but uh, these strategies are common even if uh, um, it is not a processor it is some other system then too it is uh, common uh, and uh, the way we optimize our systems, uh, larger systems on, um, with the processors and memories and uh, um, laptops and servers all the way. Um, at the basic level, the, it is really these kind of uh, effects uh, that we are taking into account. But uh, so these are all well known, of course, but uh, what is it uh, that uh, is new here uh, that we'll take a look at? How to apply it, it's not very obvious. Theoretically, it is clear that you can redu you should reduce activity. Uh, you should exploit idle times and very Whenever possible, you can scale the uh, voltage and frequency. Uh, but uh, um, that you can do this is uh, not uh, something that is new. But uh, how do you do it intelligently uh, is uh, something that is uh, uh, different here and something that we want to study. I have a doubt. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, like uh, is, um, power optimization uh, only mainly for microcontrollers or like uh, even for uh, Oh, yes. Sir. When we say power and uh, energy optimization here, it is across the board, all kinds of uh, devices. It uh, does apply to microcontrollers, but uh, uh, in fact, the examples that we'll talk about, uh, they are all uh, processors. They are full scale um, processors. Uh, so um, the uh, pipeline that you would have studied, uh, what can we do there? The cache and memories that you have studied, um, you know, uh, what we can do there, and all the way to, um, to disks and um, displays and uh, uh, all the way to servers, network, everything is actually uh, covered here when we say uh, power optimization. Microcontroller is uh, only one example. Okay, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, okay, more question? Shall we go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, thank you. Uh, so the analysis here is at a higher uh, level. Uh, higher level just means that I ought to know something about how the processor works. It is not uh, merely uh, at the level of gates and transistors uh, where enough information might not be there. If you just look at the circuit, uh, enough information might not be there. But if you also know the fact that this circuit is waiting for memory to deliver its data, for example, this is a higher level information that's not visible from the circuit itself, but um, this is at a system level. We have this knowledge, so that's why uh, our analysis at a, is at a higher abstraction level of a system because at a lower, which is a circuit and gate level, um, we don't really know uh, what's going on in the system. Okay. So let's uh, 
proceed with uh, the different components that we want to study as uh, part of this energy efficiency uh, discussion. Uh, we'll talk about uh, um, how it affects uh, uh, different components of a processor, um, processor's uh, uh, pipeline particularly, uh, but also we'll continue with um, memory and cache, uh, uh, all the way to application software and compilers. There too, there are interesting things that can be done uh, that is power aware or energy aware. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time, but uh, uh, we'll point out to where the opportunities are. Similarly, servers and data centers, uh, these are large scale computing systems. Uh, there too, uh, interestingly, power and energy concerns are actually very important. What is there inside? They are uh, um, our regular computers, of course, but then there are thousands of them, tens of thousands uh, of them. They are network in many ways. And uh, so the overall system is different. The way you would uh, strategize for energy efficiency would um, uh, be very different from the way you think about it if it is one processor, one pipeline, uh, and so on. So uh, we will uh, talk about these other two uh, at, you know, at a little uh, less detail. The first two are the ones that we'll spend more time on uh, because, of course, uh, uh, the way this uh, course is designed, um, the components have already been introduced in previous lectures, so it's easiest to carry on. Uh, it. We won't uh, reach some of these. The last topic probably we won't uh, reach today, but uh, that's okay. Uh, just to put the evolution of the processors in context, in the past, uh, um, it used to be that the evolution was always towards higher performance, um, so which led to more and more complex processors. Uh, that complexity resulted in higher power. So higher um, ILP, instruction level parallelism, was delivered, but then it is expensive because the area is larger and the power uh, correspondingly became larger. You began to dissipate more and more power. Uh, correspondingly, you are not getting proportional uh, increase in performance. So, of course, uh, this is a well-known shift in the paradigm uh, that happened uh, more than 10, 15 years ago, uh, which is that modern systems are not really, modern processors are not really getting much faster, right? The frequency is not changing. Uh, yet, um, the, in some ways, uh, the performance is improving, uh, which is happening through a, using a larger number of simpler processors rather than just making one processor more and more uh, complex. So each individual uh, processor is delivering something that is not as good, of course, as that other the, the previous generation of uh, processors. But there are a large number of them out there uh, in the same chip, for example. And through that, we are able to deliver higher throughput. Throughput uh, here could refer to just uh, the amount of work we are doing per unit time, right? Uh, for example, instructions per second. That is a metric of throughput. And uh, that uh, tells us how uh, you know, how well the system is progressing, how much work it is uh, able to deliver. So this is a well-known um, paradigm. Uh, it is um, at this stage because there is a what we are hoping is that there is parallelism. So in our system, different kinds of parallelism that you already know, not necessarily at the instruction level. Uh, if it is just from one program, I tried to extract instruction level parallelism. Uh, that's what leading was leading to an expensive processor. What? Uh, the current uh, trend is that, um, OK, we don't uh, we compromise a little bit. We don't try to make it as uh, sophisticated as possible with respect to instruction level uh, parallelism within one thread of execution. But uh, what we try to do is uh, have several programs or maybe one program with several threads of execution, each of which hopefully can independently proceed. Right. And so that all of these processors uh, um, can make uh, progress. They have work to do. So even though each of them is uh, maybe slower than uh, the larger processor, but there are so many of them uh, that uh, we uh, are able to make more progress than uh, we used to be able to do earlier. So that is the the the, the introduction of this parallelism, and uh, it's worth uh, just. Uh, um, 
looking at it mathematically with a very idealized argument just to understand where this uh, um, power and energy efficiency is coming into the picture. Of course, uh, from a performance point of view, uh, it should be clear that uh, uh, parallelism means uh, better. If uh, you have more units, then you are able to make more progress and therefore the throughput ought to be better. Uh, but uh, there are some changes here that's happening. But uh, let's just introduce, uh, suppose you had an original task on a single CPU with a given voltage and frequency and uh, that frequency was constant and that's the time and that's what uh, um, the picture looked like it uh, it took time t uh, the task took time t to uh, complete that uh, dynamic power um, that we had talked about uh, that varies as the square of the voltage and um, linearly with frequency so uh, you, the, the, the proportionality is like this so the power is uh, uh, v square f that's how the original cpu looked like now suppose i parallelize this uh, system and now i have two frequency two cpus instead that are running at half the uh, frequency. So suppose it is possible to divide my task into two tasks in a neat way. This is an idealized uh, situation, of course. Uh, then uh, at each of those frequency, uh, um, I consume half the power. Um, let's say here my even the voltage uh, did not necessarily change. Uh, well, uh, uh, you are uh, sorry, uh, the voltage did change, which caused the half of the frequency, right? I run them at half the voltage, which uh, means that I'm able to deliver only half the frequency, but I have two units. And let's assume that the task is parallelizable in that way that I am able to send it to these two units. Now, both of them, now because it's only half the task, both of them will again take time t to finish uh, the task. They're running at half the frequency, but I have only half the work to do. So this is finishing in time t. The other CPU is also finishing in time t. They are running at half the frequency and uh, what's causing half the frequency is half the voltage. So with the V square F dependency, you can see that each of them uh, dissipates power that is the original power divided by eight because it's a V by two square times F by two. Um, together, the dynamic power is only P by four. You can see the advantage here. I still managed to finish the computation in time, right, at time T. But I was just using um, two instances of CPUs that are weaker CPUs. They are not as strong. They are running only at half the frequency. But uh, we just assumed, of course, that such a parallelization was possible. Uh, in our system, but still assuming that it is possible, you can see that there is a strong argument for parallelization. Have more units that are simpler. Simpler means that I can run it at uh, lower voltage, uh, but actually overall our dynamic power is uh, decreasing and decreasing substantially. So this is again an idealized argument. It's worth uh, um, noting this as we look at uh, these various opportunities that are present for um, for, for power and energy efficiency. So with that uh, background, uh, let's um, uh, take a look at a picture that ought to be familiar from what was um, um, covered earlier. Uh, you have uh, a standard, uh, uh, you know, a simple processor pipeline. Uh, you start with a fetch uh, stage in which you are accessing instructions from an instruction memory. Uh, then there is a decode stage during that in parallel you are accessing that register file um, just um, that's the data uh, right corresponding to my um, uh, to my instruction so the i'm fetching stuff from the register file execute is where i would perform all my computation um, memory access is uh, where the data memory is uh, going to be accessed read or written and finally there is a write back uh, which again will access the same register file so here there is reading of the register file and here there is writing of the register file the actual processor uh, pipeline structure of course would be very different uh, depending on the um, specific technologies uh, who is designing it what are they trying to optimize and so on lots of details are missed out in this picture but conceptually, uh, it makes sense to think of our systems as uh, logic as consisting of these uh, stages. So this, of course, uh, ought to be familiar. Now, uh, let's follow this with um, a series of uh, just ideas. We won't talk about implementation, but high level ideas of where the opportunities are for 
um, saving energy uh, over what we might already understand as a simple reasonably high performance uh, processor pipeline. One is there is um, possibly a rate mismatch between instructions that are getting fetched and instructions that are actually committed at the end. Why is there a mismatch? So normally in a pipeline, you expect that whatever comes in goes through the pipeline and goes out. But uh, the mismatch is there due to a speculation that happens. You fetch and execute instructions even before you know whether uh, it is OK to execute them or not. This is just you are trying to execute in advance and uh, hoping that uh, you have taken the right decisions. And uh, we know very well that uh, things like branches, uh, they may slow down our, our pipelines. And uh, because there is a danger of the stalls of the pipeline, uh, we don't want to waste time. So we just go ahead and uh, and uh, predict that uh, uh, it is going to resolve in this particular way and fetch instructions and start executing instructions also. We don't complete the execution. Uh, that's why uh, this pipe you see here is thinner than that pipe at the entry. So that is what the mismatch is. We might fetch, we might partially execute some instructions and abandon them somewhere midway when we realize that, okay, maybe we made a mis mistake uh, and that's not the one that uh, we were supposed to do. So uh, first thing this points out is that uh, there is a, uh, a sort of a trade-off between performance and power. Right. So why did we do that speculation? Why did we go ahead and uh, do stuff that uh, and fetch instructions, even partially execute them without even knowing whether it should be executed or not? It is in the interest of performance, right? So that's why we did it. We didn't want to waste time um, waiting to uh, know the result of uh, some other instruction um, uh, before proceeding because that would waste time. That would introduce bubbles in the pipeline, uh, the stalls in the pipeline that you are familiar with. So to cover up for that, we did the speculation. However, you see that uh, doing extra stuff, sometimes it results in doing extra work and extra work is extra energy and that is bad from uh, energy efficiency point of view and from a power efficiency point of view. So this, these two metrics are playing against each other. Uh, performance related efficiency and power related efficiency are actually going against uh, each other. Um, OK, so that's uh, just pointing out that uh, your systems usually might be like this uh, in the interest of aggressive uh, performance. You would try to speculate. And so this pipe is larger than this pipe. Uh, and um, it's a good and it's a good idea to do something about it. Ideally, we would like that difference to be not very large. The point is you, you can't afford it to be equal uh, because uh, then your pipeline is stalling. It is bad with respect to performance, but some midway solution might be good where uh, uh, if you monitor the rates and uh, you, if you find that there is too much discrepancy between what you are um, seeing here, the input rate and the output rate at which instructions are, uh, are completed, that gives some hint about how well we are performing. If that gap is too large, then maybe I should uh, adjust that uh, instruction fetch rate uh, because it seems that gap is large means that a lot of energy is being wasted because, because instructions are coming in and we are not able to uh, utilize them and we are abandoning most of it. So ideally, I would like uh, that gap to be small and that we can do by maybe dynamically monitoring um, the situation. It is like the health of the system. And if it seems unhealthy uh, because the gap is large between this input arrow and the output arrow, then maybe we can throttle it a little bit. Uh, the rate at which you are fetching instructions can be uh, adjusted. So this is just a conceptual um, idea. Uh, how you do that is something that I am um, not covering in a lecture like this, uh, just so that we can go over some of the interesting ideas that are there uh, with respect to power efficiency in, um, in processor based systems. Uh, so this will allow us to at least grasp some of the high level ideas without necessarily going into all the details of how to implement uh, these uh, ideas. So uh, most of this talk would be um, at this level of abstraction, which is uh, we talk, we just cover the high level ideas and ignore some of the details. The details are also very interesting from an engineering point of view. Uh, while it is easy to say this, 
um, conceptually how to go about doing it is a big challenge in itself uh, the point is that um, you should do it in a way that is also power efficient right you can't afford to waste too much power for example in doing that monitor here we are saying we'll do monitor and we'll adjust uh, the uh, instruction fetching rate uh, but then uh, it has to be done smartly if uh, considering that uh, your saving objective is to save power you can't waste too much power in this control um, circuitry for example so that implementation is also challenging and very interesting, uh, but that part we will uh, leave out uh, uh, here. Of course, uh, these uh, uh, things are based on uh, on research that has uh, already been done by people, and some of that implementation were indeed, uh, you know, was indeed done to various extents um, uh, by the uh, corresponding researchers who proposed uh, those uh, ideas. But let's go on. Um, and point out several such ideas um, that um, you know, that together form this overall uh, execution pipeline ef uh, energy efficiency. Uh, here's uh, another observation. You know that a large fraction of a program uh, time is spent in loops. So if uh, we optimize the system a little bit, knowing that most of the time we are in the loops, then it might help. <coughs> Let's see how uh, it helps. You have instruction decoding that is happening right every instruction that comes in uh, gets decoded uh, but uh, the point is if you um, um, if you have this system in which let's say there's a program in which there's a small loop that is running right? that loop has some instructions maybe it has a 5 10 15 uh, instructions usually it would be a small number of instructions that the loop is uh, executing but a lot of loops that we write are tight loops like that so what's happening the let's say the the loop is running a thousand times then the same instructions are getting fetched and decoded a thousand times again and again right um, the instructions in themselves are small maybe there are only 10 of them but uh, uh, that fetching and that uh, decoding is happening a large number of times and let's focus on the decoding why decode it so many times because decoding also takes some power so here's the idea that let me store the decoded instructions in a somehow in some buffer here and uh, perform and uh, try to not do that decoding and just directly take it uh, take my decoded instructions from that uh, buffer so the first time i go through the loop i will decode the instructions store those instructions the loop body instructions in that buffer next iteration onwards i'll just read directly from the buffer and that power is saved uh, because uh, of the reduced fetches from the instruction cache. I don't have to uh, again, fetch again and again, and even this decoding again and again, I don't have to do that. So that is a way of reducing power. Um, again, you see that uh, um, this is uh, just an, a, an idea. It, uh, some of these things are not so easy to implement, uh, but uh, we're just pointing out that uh, such possibilities are present. OK, going in the same vein, um, when I have these superscalar processors, right? uh, like when I have uh, um, several instructions being executed, being fetched and being executed um, in the same cycle, there is an issue queue. So these are the instructions that are decoded uh, instructions waiting for execution. They are waiting for operands uh, to be available, uh, right? Because uh, maybe some other instruction is producing uh, data for them and they are using that data here. So usually um, there is some kind of an associative search in the that issue queue when a new operand is available. So when some operand is available, then I have to look at all of these instructions in the issue queue and uh, uh, flag that, OK, these instructions that are waiting for this operand. So now uh, we can ex uh, continue the execution of that instruction. That's what is the uh, issue queue here. Um, the pr problem is that that, is, that search is an expensive procedure from a power uh, point of view. And um, therefore, here's what we can do. We can somehow dynamically adapt the effective size of the queue. Of course, this, I, this is a hardware structure. I can't, uh, uh, I'm assuming that I can't change that hardware structure um, completely, of course, uh, uh, although some kind of technologies are there where you can, uh, um, uh, where you can 
uh, do that, but let's assume that hardware is not changing. Yet the effective issue, uh, uh, the the queue size, uh, we could still control. We don't allow the queue to uh, fill up uh, too much, and uh, that could actually, depending on how we uh, organize the queue, it could reduce power due to the reduced activity. Now, when you this is not again without penalty. Most of these power optimizations have an associated uh, performance penalty, but this is just pointing out that uh, such an optimization is possible. Um, the question. How can we know the start and the end of the loop uh, dynamically? Okay, so uh, there are uh, uh, the conditional instructions that we could use to know that the uh, loop has uh, uh, well um, that the loop has uh, uh, finished. For example, um, there are these uh, uh, the backward branch and a forward branch, and uh, these things can be used to uh, to quickly infer that the loop. Uh, has uh, finished, for example. You don't know that it started, but uh, that's all right. Uh, what we uh, see, um, for example, a standard loop template may be that uh, you have uh, um, a condition check, and uh, when that uh, condition check goes forward and that condition is true and you proceed to the next, you can assume that here is a, a loop that is starting. Then when the the you have that backward branch back to the top of the loop uh, that also that tells you that okay here is an iteration uh, of uh, the loop that is just completed when that same instruction results that condition results in false status then it means that the loop has ended so yeah these markers are there um, uh, you could break that structure but uh, um, uh, but uh, most of the loops are simple loops of this nature uh, which you can uh, which you can of course uh, uh, track um size of the decode uh, of that buffer is actually yeah that's an important um, observation what do i do about the, the 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 size right one thing is that i can't afford this size to be too large uh, because then it doesn't work if if this is a large enough this also is memory right what is that buffer that buffer is also memory so uh, if that size is large, then in in many ways uh, maybe you have uh, you're back where we, you started. This it begins to consume energy. Accesses uh, to that decode buffer itself uh, uh, become energy inefficient, and therefore somewhere may, uh, along the way maybe you lose the advantage. So this has to be a small, and therefore it applies only to small loops, not. Uh, a very large loop. So few instructions, maybe five, ten, something of that uh, nature is what it helps. But it's a practical uh, idea just because the kind of programs that most of us write, uh, that uh, pattern is actually common. Uh, you uh, having a loop in which there are a relatively small number of uh, instructions, and that's what uh, these uh, optimizations target. In general, it's a good question when there is an op uh, just because there is an optimization possibility, sh should we go ahead with the implementation? Is it really worth it? That question we should be asking. Okay, so just because conceptually it makes sense doesn't mean that uh, you uh, should actually go ahead and engineer it. Uh, we need to. Take it through a very strong uh, scrutiny and evaluation uh, phase. What kind of evaluation it is? I run typical um, applications, right? Um, if I know it is good, what my applications are. If I don't know, then uh, this uh, a very a relatively large set of uh, uh, benchmark uh, applications I should evaluate it with, just to understand how how frequently are these patterns occurring. Uh, like in this case, the pattern is that I need a small loop, um, otherwise it's not useful, right? So yeah, are such small loops present or not? Uh, that is actually an important uh, thing for us. If they are typically not present, then the, this whole thing is not worth it. So that evaluation has to be done, and that actually decides uh, uh, whether I should uh, go ahead with this. The buffer size, of course, uh, is determined by the the energy cost, for example, of that buffer, because this is supposed to be a power optimization. And uh, if you waste too much space, uh, uh, too much power accessing that buffer, then it's not worth it. So typically this kind of a buffer uh, would usually be very small. Um, let's go ahead to another uh, component register file. This is um, um, of course, uh, a, a central component. The register access happens during that decode phase. Remember, as soon as we uh, fetch the instruction, we go ahead and do the register access anyway, uh, hoping that we fetch the right uh, instruction. Uh, 
Okay, so this is actually uh, a very important component from a power optimization point of view. Um, sometimes with a, for a single within a core, uh, it is found that a large fraction, maybe something like 10 to 15 percent might be of the processor power uh, would uh, be just for the uh, register file. Would each core have a separate buffer? Uh, that uh, okay, this particular optimization we studied here, um, this is uh, for an individual pipeline. So each core uh, has that. Now, uh, LLC, um, so we have not come to the cache. The cache uh, may be a different set of optimizations, but uh, this particular uh, uh, optimization is one that is much closer to the pipeline, and uh, therefore that would be per core, right? Um, register file. Again, is a sort of a very fertile ground for us uh, to cover with respect to power uh, efficiency. Um, in general, uh, there is um, here. So here is uh, what it might be. Suppose I have n independent instructions that I am trying to execute, right, in a superscalar processor. Then, what do I have? Uh, if n is equal to three here, if it's three-way instruction level parallelism, then there are I need at least two read ports and a write port. Uh, for every instruction that I'm trying to perform in parallel. So if it is three way, um, then I have that many ports, nine uh, uh, ports in this uh, register file. So that's quite a, uh, an expensive uh, structure. And the power, of course, increases with the number of uh, ports uh, here in my system. So typically, there are a lot of things I could possibly do to reduce power in uh, register files. This itself is a very detailed topic and a very interesting topic, but I'll uh, what does that port mean? Okay, so here's what I'm doing in a register file, right? I am, re I, when an instruction is there, I am trying to read the operands of that instruction, like uh, you may have A is equal to B plus C, uh, you know, in one instruction, and that B plus C, uh, B, C, both of them have, I should be able to read simultaneously in um, the, in the same clock cycle, right? Um, and similarly, if there are three instructions, then uh, maybe six operands I ought to be able to simultaneously read uh, from the register file. Each of them we are calling a port. So these are read ports, and these what we have on the left are the write ports. In general, when the processor is in, in the, when the pipeline is in a steady state, there are that many operations happening on the register file all in the same cycle. You are having writes in the same cycle. You are having all the reads in the same cycle. Those are my nine ports in the register file. But this is an expensive proposition. As you can see, this uh, um, grows up uh, pretty bad from a power point of view. Therefore, there are a lot of things you can think of uh, doing. If this is my default, I can simplify the design. Um, instead of having nine ports, maybe I can reduce the number of ports, um, which is good from a power point of view. Uh, but uh, when you do that, it uh, it hurts performance. Of course, there is, uh, like we said, there is always this dichotomy. Right, there is a um, there's a trade-off. If you reduce power, uh, then it doesn't come for free. It hurts performance, uh, right? So if I have uh, uh, if I reduce the power, this is good from a power point of view. But of course, that means that my program will take more cycles to execute because what I was earlier fetching in all in one cycle, uh, maybe uh, now I'm not able to fetch. Maybe some of them uh, will take two cycles. So there is some performance penalty when I try to. So some uh, going along the same uh, um, track, there are lots of uh, restructuring that I can think of. Let me um, just only flash these which are without going into too much detail. You can uh, divide the register file into into banks and uh, which means that uh, uh, so somehow the access uh, um, is limited uh, in some way from each of the banks. You can read only one at a time. Uh, so you have limited the amount of access, just like the previous optimization, but uh, the power might have improved because of it. Uh, you could cluster the register files in some way um, so that the effective number of uh, ports will go down, and uh, which again imposes some limitations. Um, uh, so those, that limitation would be that, uh, uh, okay, now what if uh, from one function unit, you one cluster, you wanted to access a register file in a different cluster, then there is some penalty. So uh, without going into too much detail, and uh, I just want, would like to point out there is that there is a lot of uh, restructuring that we can do, all of which uh, 
play on that performance versus power uh, trade off. They reduce power, but uh, there is uh, some impact on the performance. And uh, hopefully the power optimizations that we finally we choose are the ones where power is saved significantly, but the performance impact is hopefully minimal. That's the kind of optimizations we are uh, looking for. Is it possible to use the same port for both the read and write? Um, you could the problem uh, uh, you could use the same port. The problem though is that the way the pipeline works, you have different in the steady state. Uh, if it's a four-way pipeline, right? You are actually trying to do it simultaneously. That's the problem. Uh, you could use the same port to do read at one point at some time and write at a different time. That's fine. But um, you know the way the pipeline works, right? I'm trying to read all of them together. And at the same time, I'm trying to write data into the register file. That's the one that is tricky. And uh, that's not for that. You actually need independent ports. So yeah, um, uh, clustering is possible. Some hierarchy is possible. Uh, you could have a small register file backed up by a large register file. What you see on the right is uh, uh, is, is that uh, implementation of this this idea. Small register file is is good if you succeed in actually finding all your data in that small register file. Then it's good because smaller uh, register file means lower power, and uh, so that's good. Um, but on the other hand, if you don't find your data here, then you have to go to that backup register file, which is large and uh, therefore uh, uh, the uh, there is some performance loss because of it uh, but hopefully you don't need to go there uh, frequently enough and it might actually be a reasonable design so uh, yeah um, that's about the register files um, let's go on to other components the execution unit itself there are lots of uh, so i have integer uh, units i have floating point uh, um, this hierarchy method is similar to cache. Uh, yes, indeed. The, uh, conceptually, this is like a cache. Okay. Um, here is a, the uh, the main idea that is uh, is a sort of a fundamental one used everywhere in digital logic: gating of the clock. You have a flip flop, and um, um, the standard flip flop has a clock as an input, right? But we gate the clock. Means that um, um, we don't allow the clock to Proceed. So the in the D flip flop where you are transferring the input D to the output Q on every rising edge of the clock, we suppress the rising edge of the clock so that the D is not uh, transferred to the output Q. And so that uh, reduces uh, power uh, because uh, the, the flip flop is not uh, active. At least part of the flip flop is not active. And whoever is using that Q output, uh, that also does not see activity. Activity here means the changing of the values. All right, so no change happens. Um, so I can gate my clock. I so that uh, prevents uh, toggling when that function unit is not in use. Uh, so wherever a function unit is not in use, uh, here these are these execution unit like uh, ALUs and uh, um, uh, floating point units and so on. The uh, in the processor there might be a lot of these units. All of them are not active uh, all the time, uh, right? So for example, and I, I we actually know which one is active because we are seeing the instruction. If it's an integer instruction, we know that the floating point units are not going to be active uh, at least for the duration. Uh, uh, for what duration? That also we might be able to figure out because uh, we are able to see the instructions and the later instructions and so on. So I can gate these the clock to this floating point unit and thereby save power in these execution units when they are not needed, right? So what duration? I know that from the knowledge of the function unit and from the knowledge of the instructions under execution. When to do this? If I know that uh, that's not going to be used, then that's an opportunity for me to get the clock. That's actually a very useful uh, mechanism for saving power. You don't uh, uh, lose any performance here, but uh, knowing what is the current instruction and the next few instructions, which we usually would have access to, uh, we can do this. Uh, uh, it's something that is widely done. It's a clever optimization, relatively simple, hopefully most of the time. Uh, and uh, something that can save us uh, quite a bit of uh, power uh, because uh, we wouldn't be do the flip flop won't unnecessarily be transitioning. Adding logic in the 
clock path raise timing issues uh, yes indeed it does this uh, has to be done intelligently but uh, uh, the this methodology is so common and it's so important that um, in fact these gated flip flops are uh, the ones that uh, typically you will find as one of the components so not the so in addition to the regular flip flops this uh, gated flip flops uh, is something that you would use uh, so yes uh, you have to be careful about uh, using this flip flops um, uh, but uh, uh, still, because these things are so Im important, uh, people, of course, have designed uh, these components. There is a little bit of uh, uh, a lot uh, um, um, a, a penalty uh, when I said there's no penalty. That is not strictly true. A little bit uh, is indeed there. But uh, because this thing is so important, people would usually um, prefer to use not uh, indiscriminately and not everywhere, but uh, uh, in some selected components that are important from saving power point of view, we, we would uh, use this. OK, so we can go along uh, this. Let me stop here with respect to uh, the what's happening in the processors uh, pipeline itself. Like uh, when I have a 64 bit data path, maybe a lot of my operands are not 64 bit. So perhaps I can do something about it. A little bit of a check I can introduce as long as uh, that check um, does not save too much, uh, does not uh, consume too much power. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth it. So let me just move on anyway. In general, that power uh, uh, the uh, gating is a very general strategy. It applies to ALUs. Uh, I mean, it applies to computation units, execution units, uh, but it also applies to many other uh, components, even outside of a processor. Uh, a lot of digital logic benefits from this power gating strategy. In general, you might have a finite state machine for a reasonably complex system that is the default active the gating is off but otherwise you might go through different levels of uh, um, low power mode um, before maybe proceeding it to pro proceeding to a more drastic sleep mode uh, in which the gating is on so maybe you wait for some cycles um, just to look uh, just observe the system because it might be expensive so like this wake up from the sleep might take some time it depends on that subsystem uh, but uh, uh, we would take the system to sleep mode, but usually we would uh, need to be a little aware because it might be expensive in terms of performance. So waking up might take time depending on what the system is. For example, it's a memory system, then it takes a lot of time to wake up. If it's a whole computer system that is being uh, put to sleep, then you know that uh, waking it up uh, takes time. So there is always a, a, a trade off here. So that's why maybe I wait for some cycles. In those cycles, if, acti if I see activity, then I go back to my active uh, state. But otherwise, if it is uh, idle for too long, then I might proceed to the sleep state. Uh, such a finite state machine might be there that uh, acts as a controller for a lot of uh, power optimization uh, strategies. Okay, so that's about the processor design. Of course, that's a very large topic and hopefully we covered uh, you know, some of the more interesting uh, ideas uh, here that uh, uh, just gives a hint about these uh, trade-offs uh, like you would have seen all are trade-offs right, between performance and power, but it is a trade-off that is actively uh, exploited uh, and we engage designers uh, uh, are engaged in these kind of trade-offs uh, all the time. Let's uh, move on to memory and cache. Um, memory optimizations for power. Uh, well, it's, it's very clear. Most well, if uh, at some level, both performance optimizations and power optimizations, we try, try to just reduce the number of memory accesses. Right. Um, this, of course, uh, reduces. Uh, uh, it improves performance, but uh, it also indirectly reduces energy. So there's nothing new about it. Most of these performance optimizations are also energy optimizations. But uh, so those are not uh, necessarily interesting. But the interesting ones for us are what, what other optimizations are there that are not necessarily in the same direction. Right? So um, just to understand uh, the context, um, you you know that the cache architecture looks something like this the conceptual view of the read operation um, i have uh, the tag and the index and that offset i have uh, when that address comes it's a read so i read from the tag i also read all of these um, if it's a four-way associative cache or something like that then i get all of them um, well, um, and finally, the one that is actually maybe it's the um, uh, cache line that is read and the appropriate using the offset, I will uh, deliver the actual word that was stateless. That's my cache. Um, I can change that architecture in various ways uh, to achieve various kinds of uh, optimizations. First of all, 
the basic idea is uh, you could add a small buffer just like that decoded instruction buffer in the pipeline. I could add a small buffer that stores recent data and that uh, fetches uh, uh, because it stores the recent data, I can try to fetch directly from this buffer and through that maybe avoid uh, some um, cache, uh, some accesses to the cache. So that's what uh, conceptually it is like you have an even smaller uh, cache um, that is variously called a filter cache or an L0 cache uh, uh, and so on. Um, and the, which is much smaller than the L1. As long as you hit within that uh, L0 cache, everything is fine and you have saved power because you don't even need to go to those uh, uh, next few levels. Uh, but of course, your uh, performance won't be as good uh, just because it is so small. Uh, you have a lower hit ratio, but overall you might still reduce power. If that hit ratio here is uh, reasonable, then it's actually worth uh, considering. And uh, there are several others uh, Along those same lines, for example, the idea of a block buffer means that you just save the last accessed cache line in a buffer, right? If the next access is to the same line, then you don't go back to the cache. In fact, you should, you can just read it from the buffer. Uh, that saves uh, quite a bit of energy because you don't need to uh, read from the larger memory. You only need to read from that smaller uh, buffer. Um, the idea is not very different. Conceptually, it is the same idea as that L0 cache, uh, but this is just a different implementation. Uh, we could also make it uh, a little uh, instead of one line, it might actually be a few lines, maybe a small fully associative structure could be used. I could use that. There is also the idea of a compiler controlled memory that uh, we call scratch pad memory, uh, which is uh, um, uh, which is essentially uh, because the compiler is controlling it, you don't need to uh, um, incur the cost of uh, all the management costs the, uh, of the cache, right? We are, everything, all management is in hardware. And if, uh, if from software we are directly controlling it, uh, then it could be that I have a single cycle, uh, just like uh, uh, access to it. But this is on chip as opposed to an off chip DRAM or something. This uh, data cache is also on chip. So they are equally efficient, but uh, the, there is a hardware management that is happening here, which is bad from an um, energy point of view. But here, because the management is in software, um, uh, this is actually something that is very nice from a power point of view because all that overhead of tags and uh, uh, all those uh, fully associative structures, the comparison, all of them uh, is not there. So it can be fast, it can be predictable, and in fact, it can be lower power uh, than the uh, cache itself. So some of the embedded processors and also some of the high performance processors have uh, explored uh, ideas like this where the management is done in software. It's harder to do that management, uh, but if you can do uh, a reasonable management, then uh, you can actually save uh, power. There. So uh, then, then the associated problems that come up is what data, what code should reside in the uh, scratch pad memory? This becomes an application programmer's problem or a compiler's uh, problem. And uh, so it is like the hardware becomes simpler, uh, but some of the complexity is moved to the software. But that is a general idea that has been tried out in various contexts in the simpler processors, embedded processors. It has always been there, uh, but uh, even in the in more uh, sophisticated processors, uh, people have uh, tried out variations of this idea. OK, um, just pointing out a few other uh, cache related optimizations and we can stop uh, today's discussion there. Uh, the conventional uh, cache works like this. You, uh, you have a four-way associative cache. There is a tag comparison that is simultaneous. All of these are compared uh, at once and we choose uh, one of them uh, finally, whichever one was the hit. But uh, the uh, it's an expensive structure because uh, your data is there in only one of the caches and uh, yet uh, you are uh, accessing the tags and the data of all of the um, I, I didn't mean one of the caches one of the ways where yet you are accessing the tags and the data of all of the ways right uh, simultaneously so that's bad from an energy point of view although that's uh, good for performance as we already know so here's what we could do we could actually sequentialize the tag and data accesses this is sometimes done uh, in last level caches where you can afford uh, more uh, time so here's one thing that you do you first access the tags don't access the data and whichever one match let's say this one matched that tag matched then in the next cycle maybe you access the uh, associated data 
So this is good from a power point of view, an energy point of view, because at least it saved the accesses to these other three data um, uh, banks that, uh, of course, didn't have the data. It was a waste earlier and that we uh, we saved upon. But then there was, of course, a performance penalty. This is this did not come for free. Uh, and we uh, we lost some performance because uh, whenever uh, you, uh, you you need to go, you need to wait for a second uh, um, cycle uh, in order to get there and therefore you lost uh, some space. So you could go ahead uh, with uh, some uh, advanced op optimizations here. One is uh, why do that? You Why don't, can't I just predict the way? Let me predict that this is the correct way. If the prediction is correct, everything is fine. Um, if it is not correct, once in a while it won't be correct, then you go and fetch from all the other tags and data uh, and so on. So it depends on the kind of prediction that I have. This is not very different from several other kinds of predictions that we do uh, in our uh, uh, processor systems. If our prediction mechanism is good, then we could actually save some power here. Um, OK, so maybe this is a good time to stop and that uh, make sure that the rest of the program is not uh, delayed. So we covered the processor and the memory. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, to a lesser extent, I had some discussion about the software and the compiler side, what you can do to save power and proceed to servers and large scale data uh, uh, centers, for example, what are the issues that are involved? Uh, we won't talk uh, uh, in, in as much detail about the individual optimization, but we'll point out there are a lot of interesting things that happen there too. Maybe in that continuation uh, lecture next week, I'll uh, I'll complete this uh, before proceeding to the temperature related optimizations, which is uh, uh, really the focus of that other discussion. OK. Um, what are ways to measure power and energy from a system point of view? Tools. Uh, OK, yeah, this is an interesting question. We do have a lab in the next. So next week when I continue it, uh, there is a, um, a, a lab component where uh, uh, you'll be introduced to um, to some of the uh, uh, performance plus power and thermal simulation tool that hopefully people find interesting. Uh, so um, today I don't have a lab, uh, but in fact the the conclusion of, of all of that, uh, which uh, leads to um, some temperature effects that we would like to affect, we would like to study uh, that we will do in a lab where this is performed in a simulation. There are ways usually modern processors allow us to uh, to have some visibility into the power and energy situation. Um, there are energy counters just like performance counters uh, uh, that we can monitor how much energy has been spent. Uh, we can energy. So that is a, an actual measurement and uh, uh, that is available to a limited extent. It is not that every component you can measure, but uh, at some gross level you can measure. Uh, but otherwise, a lot of this study is done through modeling and simulation. Um, certainly, um, you need to be able to do these studies and convince yourself uh, in a simulation before proceeding to the hardware. So while hardware does um, give some interesting um, ob monitors and observing and knob and uh, um, uh, both mo uh, monitor and control mechanisms, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, so uh, what is visible all the way to the software might still be limited. There will be a lot more that can be done in the hardware and for that uh, typically simulators will be used. Um, but uh, more of that is coming next week. If there is a miss in the L0 cache, it increases the latency. Yes. Um, so there will be some performance hit if the hit ratio is that low. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there is uh, uh, some. Uh, so the, uh, like you know the way the cache hierarchy works. If uh, your hits are good enough, uh, then the system works well, both from a performance point of view and from a power point of view. But uh, if there is, uh, if there are, uh, you know, uh, too many misses, then it backfires and maybe there is, uh, if you are going, having to proceed to L1 too frequently, then it is not worth it. So this is a little bit of a fine engineering that has to be done. The sizes has to have to be controlled. If it's too large, then it's not worth it. If it is too small, uh, then you will be uh, having misses and therefore it's not worth it. So some ideal, um, um, a sweet spot if you are able to hit for the application that you are considering, uh, there is a possibility. So these things are uh, um, are put up as possibilities, uh, not necessarily valid all the time, uh, but the ones that I discussed here are indeed ones that uh, 
uh, are relatively pos uh, relatively popular. Uh, what's the difference in modeling? Oh, first of all, I should of course check with the organizers. I can't afford to take more time than. Uh, yeah, actually, actually we, uh, uh, we also uh, have uh, some. Uh, sorry, I'm getting an echo. We have an out clearing session at four o'clock. So, is it possible for you to be available? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Today I'll be yeah. available at four o'clock. And so maybe we can we take can some more. Time. We can take some more questions also at that time. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Fine. Let uh, let me stop here then because it's a convenient time to stop. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the interesting lecture. Uh, is it okay if we share the slides to the students? Um, sure. I uh, so should I separately send the slides to you? Uh, you can send it to me. Also, there is an option in Teams. You can upload it in this channel. There is a file. So 